First, we need to understand what muscle growth is in the first place. Muscle growth is simply an increase in the size of our muscles. This occurs primarily by what is known as myofibrillar hypertrophy. If we look at the anatomy of a muscle, myofibrils are the smallest units of muscle, which are basically just bundles of contractile tissue. Muscle growth occurs as a result of the number of these myofibrils increasing. This makes each muscle fibre larger in diameter. And when each muscle fibre is larger, it results in a thicker overall muscle belly. So how do we achieve this adaptation? There are two primary factors which can promote muscle growth, resistance training and nutritional strategies. First, let's discuss resistance training. This is because it is the number one priority for building muscle. To understand why, let's take a look at what is known as the general adaptation syndrome. At the most fundamental level, adaptation occurs as a result of an initial stimulus. This stimulus causes a disruption to homeostasis, or the biological system's normal state of being. As a result, the system adapts to this stress in some capacity. In the case of muscle growth, the initial stimulus is resistance training, and the adaptation we are concerned with is muscle growth, among others. So without resistance training, there is no significant stimulus to adapt to. So as a whole, resistance training is going to be our number one priority for muscle growth. But let's also go into a little more detail on how to train to achieve the greatest hypertrophic stimulus. The first variable to discuss is proximity to failure. In other words, how close a set is taken to the point of failure. So the question is, how close to failure should we train? Should we train to complete failure on every rep? Or should we leave some reps in the tank? As an overview, this meta-regression analyzed the effects of proximity to failure on muscle growth. The overall relationship between reps in reserve and muscle growth looked like this. Muscle growth is able to be achieved when training with more than 10 reps in reserve. But greater gains are generally observed when training with fewer reps in reserve. In other words, when training closer to failure. So in practice, we probably want to take sets fairly close to failure if the goal is to maximize muscle growth. As a practical recommendation, we want to leave no more than around 3 reps in reserve to maximize the hypertrophic stimulus of each set. The next variable influencing muscle growth is rep ranges and load. So the question is, how heavy should we lift and how many reps should we perform? The reason these two variables are combined as one is because they directly affect each other. Assuming we are training close to failure, lifting heavier loads means we can't perform as many reps while lifting lighter loads allows us to perform more reps, and vice versa. So where on this spectrum should we lift? As a general overview, this meta-analysis compared the effects of training with different loading ranges on hypertrophy. Interventions were categorized into three groups. Heavy loads, defined as an 8 rep max or heavier. Moderate loads, defined as anything between a 9 to 15 RM. And light loads, defined as anything greater than a 15 RM. It was found that there were no significant differences in muscle growth when comparing light versus heavy loads, light versus moderate loads, or moderate versus heavy loads. In other words, all loading ranges seemed to produce similar growth. So overall, the exact reps or load we train with doesn't seem to have a major influence on muscle growth, provided we are training sufficiently close to failure. However, it is possible for loads to be too heavy to maximize muscle growth. For example, this study compared the effects of training within the 8 to 12 versus 2 to 4 rep range. It was found that muscle thickness increased from both rep ranges, but slightly superior gains were observed when training in the moderate rep range. Furthermore, it is also possible for loads to be too light to maximize muscle growth. For example, this study compared the effects of training with 20, 40, 60, and 80% 1RM loads on muscle growth. It was found that all loads produced similar increases in muscle thickness apart from the 20% 1RM condition, which experienced slightly inferior growth. So as a practical recommendation, we can train anywhere within the approximate 5 to 20 rep range when the goal is to maximize muscle growth. Load can then be adjusted to meet the target rep range you are attempting to train within. So assuming we are training close to failure and within the effective hypertrophy rep ranges, the next important variable is volume. 
In the context of hypertrophy training, volume refers to the total number of sets a muscle is trained with per week. For example, in this training routine, the back is trained with 8 sets on day 2 and 4 sets on day 4. So total weekly volume for the back would be 12 sets. So the question is, how many total sets should be performed for each muscle group to maximize hypertrophy? As an overview, this meta-regression analyzed the effects of weekly volume on muscle growth. Overall, more volume tends to result in greater muscle growth. However, there seems to be somewhat of a diminishing returns response, with more sets resulting in slightly less additional growth. So, notable muscle growth can be achieved even with very low volumes. But for muscle groups that you especially want to prioritize, you may want to train those with at least 10 total sets per week. And if you want to maximize muscle growth at all costs, you probably want to train those muscles with at least 20 sets per week. The next variable to discuss is rest periods. How long should we rest between sets to maximize muscle growth? Should we rest until we can repeat performance of the previous set, or is it better to limit rest periods so that we are not letting the muscle fully recover? This meta-analysis analyzed the evidence on the effects of rest periods on muscle growth. Rest periods were categorized into short rest, defined as one minute or less, moderate rest, defined as between one to two minutes, long rest, defined as two to three minutes, or very long rest, defined as three minutes or longer. It was found that all rest period durations were effectively able to produce muscle growth. Although moderate rest periods seem to promote slightly greater gains compared with the other groups. So I would say that the exact rest periods you implement are somewhat dependent on your priorities. If you want to maximize muscle growth at all costs, then resting around two to three minutes per set is probably ideal. However, if you want to get a good stimulus in a short time frame without significantly compromising the hypertrophic stimulus, then resting less than two minutes might be a good option. And the last primary training variable that is important for long-term muscle growth is the application of progressive overload. Once the system adapts to the stressor, the stimulus needs to become more challenging over time. So an even more stressful stimulus must be provided to stimulate further adaptation and so on. If the exact same stimulus is provided, further adaptation won't take place. It will just be a state of detraining and retraining. The primary way in which progressive overload is achieved for hypertrophy training is via an increase in reps and load over time. With all other factors equated, performing the same exercise with a greater total tonnage is going to provide a superior hypertrophic stimulus. However, we also want to make sure that we aren't increasing reps or load at the expense of lifting technique, otherwise we might actually be sacrificing the hypertrophic stimulus. And from a more long-term perspective, we can increase volume. Training a muscle group with more total sets per week typically produces superior growth. So if a trainee wants to accelerate their rate of muscle growth, increasing volume by training more days per week or performing more sets per session can be implemented. However, this takes more time and effort and might not be a viable option in all cases. So, while resistance training is going to be the most important factor for building muscle, there are also some nutritional variables which can assist the muscle growth process. There are two primary nutritional variables which can influence the magnitude of muscle growth achieved via resistance training. The first is protein intake. A high protein diet in conjunction with resistance training typically produces greater muscle growth. So the question is, how much protein should we consume each day to maximize muscle growth? We have two meta-analyses which can help us answer this question. This first one aimed to evaluate the effects of total daily protein intake on gains in lean mass. Across a total of 105 studies, including over 5,000 subjects, the relationship looked something like this. Higher protein intakes tend to be beneficial for increasing lean mass, but the relationship is not linear. Once total daily protein intake surpassed around 1.3 grams per kilogram per day, there seems to be less additional benefit from consuming more. Although it should be noted that this relationship included studies with all different populations, and most of them without resistance training. So as a slightly more specific paper, this meta-analysis explored the effects of protein supplementation on gains in muscle mass in lifters performing resistance training. 
A breakpoint analysis found that protein supplementation was beneficial for gains in fat-free mass when total daily intake was less than around 1.6 grams per kilogram per day. However, once total daily protein intake exceeded this point, protein supplementation had minimal additional benefits. So based on the data we have, I would say that the relationship between protein intake and muscle growth probably looks something like this. More is generally beneficial, but there is likely diminishing returns. As a practical recommendation, those who want to gain significant muscle mass should probably aim to consume at least around 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day of total protein. And if you want to get every last percentage of potential gains possible, you might want to opt for an even higher intake of around 2 grams per kilogram per day. And the other primary nutrition variable that can influence muscle growth is energy balance. In other words, whether we are in a calorie surplus, maintenance, or deficit. It is possible for muscle growth to be achieved during all energy balance states. However, the likelihood and magnitude of growth achieved during each energy balance state differs. In most cases, a surplus will result in the greatest magnitude of muscle growth, whereas less muscle growth and potentially slight reductions in muscle mass are typically observed during a prolonged calorie deficit. So, does this mean we should always try to be in a calorie surplus over time? Well, probably not. This is because a surplus also tends to result in fat gain. In fact, a surplus will usually be mostly fat gain rather than lean mass gain. And since most people also aim to reduce body fat, a surplus goes counter to this goal. This study compared the body composition of male bodybuilders, sumo wrestlers, and the general population. As expected, sumo wrestlers were the heaviest, followed by the bodybuilders, then the general population. It was found that the sumo wrestlers carried 10 kilograms more fat-free mass than the bodybuilders. However, they also had a significantly higher body fat percentage too. So, while weight gain will usually be best for gaining lean mass in an absolute sense, it will also usually result in significant fat gain. And to then reduce this body fat via a deficit will likely result in some lean mass losses. So it could be that the anabolic effects of a surplus are counteracted by the subsequent catabolic effects of a deficit. Although it isn't entirely clear at this stage if going through cyclical bulking and cutting cycles would result in more muscle growth than roughly maintaining body weight at a healthy body fat level. Let's now summarize this video and establish some practical recommendations. Muscle growth is a structural adaptation occurring primarily via what is known as myofibrillar hypertrophy. This is an increase in the amount of total contractile tissue within the muscle fibers, resulting in a thicker overall muscle belly. The number one priority for muscle growth is resistance training. Resistance training is the initial stimulus which causes muscle growth to occur as an adaptation. In terms of how to best train to build muscle, we want to take each set fairly close to failure, leaving no more than around 3 reps in reserve on each set. Train somewhere within the 5 to 20 rep range and adjust the load used to suit the rep range. Train important muscles with at least 10 total sets per week and with up to 20 sets if you want to maximize muscle growth. Ideal rest periods seem to be somewhere around 1 to 3 minutes between sets and apply progressive overload by increasing reps and load over time while maintaining effective lifting technique. Nutrition can also influence the magnitude of muscle growth achieved from resistance training. A high protein intake generally promotes superior hypertrophy. Aim to consume at least 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day for significant muscle growth, or beyond 2 grams per kilogram per day to maximize muscle growth at all costs. A calorie surplus also typically promotes greater gains in lean mass, but it also tends to result in significant fat gain too. And at this stage, it isn't entirely clear if cyclical bulking and cutting phases would promote superior long-term muscle growth compared with approximately maintaining a healthy level of body fat. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.